Welcome back to the Civility Clinic. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie. People with back pain come to see me because they haven't been able to get rid of their pain, either on their own or with the help of other doctors. Maybe they've tried a lot of different things already, but there's almost always options that they haven't considered. Today, we're gonna to go over all of the different treatment strategies for back pain, starting with the most basic, conservative, and safe, and finishing with the most complex, invasive, and risky. This video and the resources below are not personalized medical advice. They're meant as a guide to help you understand why your doctor may be presenting you with certain options over others. Before you start any new treatment strategy for back pain, please discuss it with your healthcare providers. There are six major types of treatments, lifestyle, physical, psychological, pharmacological, interventional, and surgical. Each one of these could take up their own video series. So let me know in the comments if that's something you'd wanna see. Lifestyle changes. Compared to everything else we talk about in this video, lifestyle changes are the safest, longest lasting, and most important treatment strategy. With the proper motivation, resources, and support, Anyone can change their lifestyle to improve their back pain. Maintaining the health of your spine requires you to maintain the strength of your front and back core muscles, so they're easily engaged during daily activities to lift strain off of your facet joints and discs and keep the spinal tunnel and its windows nice and open. Muscles need to practice contracting and relaxing with regular activity and stretching. Bones need vitamins, minerals, and weight-bearing exercises like walking to stay strong. Nerves need vitamins too, and they're very sensitive to toxins like alcohol or drugs. And our whole body needs sleep to repair and revitalize. All of this boils down to having good posture, staying active, eating nutritious foods, and getting enough sleep. But I don't wanna be just another doctor who tells you to exercise more. Your body is a machine made out of muscles, bones, and nerves, and if you don't keep moving the muscle machine, it's gonna get stiffer, weaker, and more prone to injury. I like to say motion is lotion, because motion lubricates joints, pumps hemoglobin, and maximizes the body's functional capacity. That's why it's important to practice healthy, safe, and fun movements regularly. Whatever movement you can enjoy doing every day is what your body will benefit from for the rest of your life. This can be as simple as straightening your spine, closing your eyes, and focusing on your breathing for a few minutes. This by itself already stimulates the release of endorphins, meaning that meditation counts as physical activity. Even people with severe, debilitating back pain who can't tolerate other forms of exercise can benefit from meditation. The safest, simplest way to engage the front and back core muscles is in a neutral spine position, which can be achieved while sitting or standing upright or laying flat. This is why meditation, tai chi, and yoga are highly recommended and easily accessible lifestyle strategies in pain management. But you don't have to do yoga, maybe your activity of choice is strolling the neighborhood, cycling, dancing, whatever it is, it should be something that feels so easy it doesn't really count as exercise. The best type of physical activity slowly gets your heart rate up, makes your breathing heavy, and covers you in a light sweat. Maintaining healthy habits like regular physical activity relies only on your motivation to do so. It's so easy, it's hard. That's why I prescribe a guided home exercise program with one-page handouts that are designed to be gentle and done at home without any fancy equipment. Physical strategies. Equipment. There are so many different products available on the market that claim to help relieve back pain. I once had a patient who dropped hundreds of dollars on different supplements, creams, and braces to help with his severe musculoskeletal back pain, but none of it really helped. Shocker. Should you hang upside down or roll backwards on a wheel or a bouncy ball? You can try that if you want, but talk to your doctor beforehand. Hanging upside down is a form of traction. It opens up the spaces in the spinal tunnel and its windows and provides a nice stretch. But once you're right side up again, if you're not doing other things to help maintain the health of your spine, it's likely your back pain won't change too much. You can achieve the same stretching traction effect by laying flat or standing tall and just reaching your arms up over your head. No equipment needed and there's a much smaller chance you will fall headfirst into the ground. Rolling backwards does help massage the back core and engages your front core, but without proper biomechanics, this position can be painful and even harmful, so I recommend talking to your doctor and your physical therapist about smart movements before purchasing home equipment for back pain. If it's super expensive, it's probably not worth it. If it hurts, I recommend not doing it. Should you go to a chiropractor? As long as they don't do any high velocity, low amplitude spinal rotation and I'll give a high-velocity thrust. One final thrust. 
piece of cake. This technique cracks the joints in your spine, like cracking your knuckles. Say crack again. Crack. And it may help with certain types of pain. But even when done correctly, any sudden movements of the neck or spine risk increasing pain or causing further injury, which to me isn't worth the potential benefits. Should you wear a back brace? Only if your spine doctor recommends it. People with scoliosis, spinal fractures, or recent spine surgery usually do need to wear a back brace, but it's just for a limited period of time, not for life. Back braces can be temporarily helpful in relieving back pain. But if you rely on your back brace too much, you're discouraging your front and back core muscles from doing their jobs. Your muscles actually get weaker because they don't have to activate since a brace is maintaining good posture for you. Modalities and therapies. Physical modalities are things like heat or ice that transfer energy to the body to help reduce pain. Heat and massage help relax tight muscles and ice helps reduce inflammation and numb the area. There are other physical modalities that require specialized equipment that you might find at a physical therapy gym, like ultrasound, lasers, and TENS units. Respectively, these techie modalities use sound waves, light waves, and electrical impulses applied to the skin's surface to either reduce inflammation, stir up inflammation to encourage healing, or stimulate weakened muscles and modulate pain signals. Physical and occupational therapists are the experts on physical modalities and safe movements. You can exercise at home and build up your strength and endurance, but after a back pain episode, the body's movements need to be retrained and corrected to minimize the risk of future injury. That's why it's so important to work with physical and occupational therapy. Therapists will work with you on your functional goals, which for everyone include mobility, self-care, safety, and pain reduction. Psychological. It's important to recognize the things that trigger pain, like strenuous activity or stress, for example. But constantly avoiding pain triggers is no way to live. Instead, people cope. We all have different ways of coping with pain. Many people develop unhealthy coping strategies like smoking cigarettes or isolating themselves from others. But there are many healthy ways to cope with pain that are under our conscious control. Meditation, mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, and distraction are just some examples of healthy, safe, and oftentimes very effective pain coping strategies that don't get used enough. These techniques have been proven to enhance all the other treatment strategies for back pain, and they're essentially risk-free. Check the description for a great article supporting this. The more you know about psychological treatments for back pain, the more you can replace unhealthy coping strategies with the healthy ones that work best for you. Still, humans are creatures of habit. Even when we know something isn't healthy, we do it anyway because we want to. Bad habits are the hardest to break, but we do have the ability to change our own behavior. This is how a psychologist can help. I'm not a psychologist, but I know a lot of great ones. They're easy to talk to, they're supportive, and they're good listeners. Pain psychologists are the experts on coping strategies, and working with them will help you hone your ability to consciously influence your nervous system and the way it processes pain. Pharmacological. The goal of pharmacology or medication treatments for back pain is to find the lowest effective doses that help someone achieve their functional goals and to use medications only as long as they are needed or helpful. Ideally, people with back pain shouldn't need to be on pain medications for the rest of their lives. That's why it's important to use all the tools in the toolbox because the combination of different treatments for back pain is greater than the sum of its parts. Before starting a medication for back pain, it's important to consider metabolism, dosing, frequency, and form. The liver and kidneys process most of the medications we put in our bodies, so know your baseline liver and kidney function before you start anything new. Any medication can seem ineffective if you take only a low dose, while too high of a dose can be harmful, toxic, or even fatal. Some medications can be taken a few times a day as needed, but some need to be taken consistently every day to be effective. I've met several people who get stomach pain just because they have to take a bunch of pills all day. This is when other medication forms can come in handy, like crushable tablets, topical creams, or even infusions. I don't like to burden people with more medications than they need, and it's important to consider what is practical for someone's lifestyle. Finally, before starting a new pain medication, it's important to know if you're taking any other medications that might potentially interact and cause adverse events. On to the medications themselves. You can probably already tell me the names of most of the pain medications on the shelf at your local pharmacy. These over-the-counter, or OTC, medications reduce inflammation, cause numbness, or otherwise target non-opioid pain pathways to provide relief. All of these are generally safe, affordable, and effective for most musculoskeletal aches and pains, and even for minor neuropathic pain. 
There are also prescription strength anti-inflammatory and numbing medications, which are just the same or slightly stronger than the over-the-counter versions. Other commonly prescribed medications for back pain include muscle relaxants, which can help ease muscle pain, but they can also make you drowsy or weak at high doses. Medications for nerve pain target the central nervous system to influence its signaling and thus the perception of pain. First-line nerve pain medications work the same way anti-seizure medications do, because both pain signaling and seizures involve overactivity of the nervous system. Inhibiting the nervous system can cause drowsiness or sluggishness, which are common side effects of first-line nerve pain medications. Second-line nerve pain medications boost the activity of neurotransmitters like norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine, which help reinforce the nervous system against inappropriate pain signals. These neurotransmitters also help with depression and anxiety, so second-line nerve pain medications are also classified as antidepressants, but I prescribe them primarily for pain. Third-line nerve pain medications are a little more out of the box, and some are considered experimental. They all tap into different non-opioid pathways that reduce pain signaling and can help reprogram the nervous system to desensitize it to non-harmful stimuli. For acutely excruciating pain, or pain related to terminal cancer, this is when we bring out the big guns, opioids. Opioids are great for quickly shutting down pain signaling through the opioid pathway, and this is very appropriate after a traumatic injury or major surgery, but you already know opioids can be habit-forming and can actually hypersensitize your nervous system to pain, which makes every other treatment strategy less effective. This is why the standard of care is to replace opioid medications with safer and more effective strategies in the long run. If you have any questions about opioids, please leave them in the comments and I'll answer them in my upcoming video series dedicated to opioids. Interventions. Interventions are minimally invasive procedures that can be done in an outpatient setting. This means you're going to get poked with a needle, but then you get to go home. Interventions are riskier than all the other strategies we've discussed so far, but their benefits usually outweigh the risks for patients who meet the appropriate criteria. Interventions can be a great choice if you're hoping to delay or avoid surgery, or if you just want to decrease the number of pain medications you have to take. Trigger point injections involve injecting numbing medication like lidocaine into painful back muscles, those taut myofascial bands, to help them relax and reset. Personally, these are some of my favorite procedures to do because they're easy and they can provide immediate relief for someone with back pain. Prolotherapy is similar to trigger point injections, but instead of just lidocaine, sugar water, or dextrose 50%, is also injected. Sugar water is not harmful, but it's considered an irritant that can encourage tissue healing, which can help calm down pain signals. Prolotherapy is technically a form of regenerative medicine because of sugar water's restorative effects on nerves, muscles, tendons, and ligaments. The other types of regenerative medicine involve harvesting stem cells, either from spitting down your blood with a centrifuge, that's platelet-rich plasma or PRP, or extracting stem cells from your own bones, usually the hip. The stem cells then get injected into painful or damaged areas. We currently do not have enough evidence to know for sure if these injected stem cells grow into the types of cells we want. We don't know if they can replace damaged painful structures or help restore function. The best evidence we have for the effectiveness of stem cell therapy is in cases of peripheral musculoskeletal injuries, like in the knee or the shoulder, but not the back. So please be cautious about any doctor who tells you they can inject stem cells into your back and reverse the wear and tear in your spine and make your pain go away. This is not possible. Yet. Non-regenerative spine injections are performed by pain specialists all the time, and if you're considering getting one, you should know the difference between the most common types. Spine injections must be performed using x-ray guidance, a technique called fluoroscopy. It's like a real-time low-dose x-ray that helps guide a needle exactly where it needs to go. Since these interventions involve radiation exposure, they're performed in a protected setting like a fluoroscopy suite or an operating room. If someone has arthritis in the joints of their spine, they may be a candidate for facet medial branch blocks. The medial branches are the nerves that send signals from your back joints to your brain. Blocking them means you're injecting numbing medication like lidocaine to interrupt pain signaling. This can be done anywhere along the spine, and a similar procedure can be done for low back pain caused by SI joint arthritis. It's important to understand that blocks are a temporary pain relieving strategy, meaning the numbing medication will wear off in six to eight hours. But this is a test to see whether or not blocking these nerves helps relieve someone's pain. If during those six to eight hours, someone is able to do their usual daily activities with reduced pain, then the test is a success. This is actually the definitive way to diagnose back pain caused by facet or SI joint arthritis. 
After a successful test block, I bring my patients back, put my needles in the same place over the facet nerves or SI joint, but this time my needles have a special heated tip that basically zaps the nerves to interrupt pain signaling for up to 6 to 12 months. This is called radiofrequency ablation, or RFA, and it should only be done after at least one successful block procedure. Epidural steroid injections inject steroid medication into the epidural space, which is just inside the spinal tunnel but outside the spinal cord. This type of intervention is usually done for neuropathic back pain, meaning the cord or its exiting nerve roots are being pinched or irritated. Steroids are powerful anti-inflammatories and can provide a lot of pain relief, but steroids can have undesirable side effects. They can drive up your blood sugar, which is especially important if you have diabetes. They can cause insomnia, weight gain, fluid retention, and loss of bone density with long-term use. This is why it's important to limit how many doses of steroids you get in a year. If the only doses of steroids you're getting are from epidural injections, it's safe to have up to four epidurals per year, which works out well since these injections are only expected to provide pain relief for up to three months anyway. Epidurals don't actually reverse any cause of back pain, but during those three months of improved pain control, the hope is that you can maximize gains from your home exercises and physical therapy sessions, which again are the strategies that will serve you well for the rest of your life. There are a couple of other interventions I want to mention, which involve implanting a device into the spinal tunnel, which is more invasive and permanent than a simple injection. You may have heard of spinal cord stimulation. This involves placing a wire along the inner roof of the spinal tunnel, aka the epidural space. This wire is attached to a battery that's implanted under the skin, and the wire sends imperceptible waves of electrical stimulation to your spinal cord, which can then help interrupt or modulate pain signaling. Another implanted device is called a pain pump, which involves placing a thin tube inside the sac that encases the spinal cord. This is called the intrathecal space, and it's even deeper than the epidural space. This tube is then attached to a hockey puck looking thing filled with pain medication that's implanted under the skin, and the hockey puck pumps microdoses of pain medication directly to the spinal cord. This can help relieve back pain while minimizing the doses of pain medication someone requires. It's a big commitment to implant a foreign body so close to your spine. It needs to be replaced every few years, it might malfunction or physically break, or it might get infected and that infection can spread. This is why these options should not be considered lightly or hastily. Surgical. Surgery is the most invasive and high risk treatment strategy for back pain. There's cutting and sometimes hammering very close to the main power cord of your body. Because spine surgery is so high stakes, not just anyone can or should get spine surgery. The indications for spine surgery are neurological deficits like weakness, numbness, and changes in bladder or bowel control. Debilitating back pain that's due to structural defects like severe narrowing around the cord or its exiting nerve roots is also a reason to consider surgery. The goal of spine surgery is to correct these defects to restore strength and other neurological functions. Still, every spine surgeon I've ever worked with will tell you that even though spine surgery can correct the structural integrity of the spine, this does not guarantee relief from back pain or improved function. A laminectomy means a small chunk of bone is removed from the roof of the spinal tunnel to help open up the space. A discectomy means a chunk of an intervertebral disc is removed to help offload any pinching of the cord or nerve roots and open up the space. A spinal fusion means metal hardware is being screwed into the bone to reinforce the stability of the spinal column and maintain an open space. Spine surgery unfortunately contributes to its own umbrella diagnosis of back pain. It's a crude term and I don't like saying it, but it's literally called failed back surgery syndrome, meaning spine surgery happened, but pain hasn't improved. Say someone's post-operative imaging showed their spinal column is aligned and their tunnel is wide open, but they're still having persistent pain and functional impairment. I wouldn't say the spine surgeon failed this patient. Instead, I'd say this person's pain is due to issues that are not just structural, and other strategies for comprehensive pain management need to be explored. There are a ton of different options to treat back pain, but that doesn't mean you need to try them all, nor should you try them all if you don't have to. Most cases of back pain improve with lifestyle changes, physical therapy, over-the-counter medications, and time. I personalize my recommendations for back pain treatments depending on my patient's individual symptoms, risk factors, and goals. It's every clinician's job to explain the risks and benefits of possible treatment options, and it's every person's job to collaborate with their doctors so they can make informed decisions and manage their own care. 
I hope you enjoyed this overview of all the different treatment strategies for back pain. I try to be as comprehensive and concise as possible, but please let me know if you have any questions. And remember, the benefits always outweigh the risks when it comes to liking and subscribing. Thanks for watching.